Botanical roots are eclectic, especially coming from the rural town of Frankmuth, Michigan. Uh, we had a somewhat limited stack of genres, being that a lot of the music that we came up on was in our parents' vinyl collection, pretty much. So we had stuff from like, from like if we're if we're like playing gospel, you know, we got some like like the Billy Preston stuff where we're going. Kind of sounds a bit baseball-y, but you get the idea. So we grew up with a lot of blues, a lot of folk, a lot of uh, rock and roll, classic rock and roll, uh, even like classic pop, you know, and a lot of classic rock stuff. You know, obviously every, everything from from Zeppelin to the Rolling Stones, a lot of a lot of that influence. But then we had like this kind of folk countryside to uh, our upbringing. So there was some like John Denver and there was James Taylor. One of the biggest influences on me is Crosby, Stills, Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and Neil Young. All of that kind of stuff just cross-sectioned into, into this, whatever we're doing here now. My mother played guitar and that's kind of what got my foot in the door for music. I took lessons for a long time and, and then I jumped around and played a at a number of instruments before I actually jumped onto the drum kit for the first time. I became really close with the other guys. We all have known each other our entire lives, but I came really close with them in middle school. They had a guitarist, they had a bass player, they had a singer, and they had uh, the need for a drummer when I would come over and hang out. So I started playing the drums just kind of as a hobby. My great-grandfather had um, uh, a Hammond M100 organ, which is a lot like this as far as the guts go, but. This is the this is the thing I always dreamed of the the, the B three so uh, that's kind of what got me uh, you know musical influence wise into playing keyboards is uh, you know the organ and, and a lot of gospel music specifically Billy Preston we we all play multiple instruments and we also write on multiple instruments too so I I've, I've written a lot of the guitar parts and Jake and Sam will come in and even Josh actually Josh is a fantastic drummer. Uh, he's a wild drummer, and he'll come in, and, and they all, we all just like throw our two cents in when we're writing. So it's extremely collaborative, and very effective at the same time. So it's it's fun. We all like to push each other to our limits. The songwriting process is pretty. It's it's all of us screaming at each other until we have something that has some semblance of uh, sense to it. Somebody will bring in a riff, and it could be like like Daniel on the the octave mandolin. It could be a new instrument. It could be a, a B bender where Jake wrote a riff on that. And then we, I suppose we could create a chord progression there and really, you know, feel it out and uh, pretty much discuss what is this scene? What is this story? What part of the story is it? And from there we would uh, develop the song sonically and, you know, with the context clues of what story we're trying to tell there. And then Josh will, swoop in but I mean it's really different every time it's it, it changes from song to song and I think that's one of the elements that keep the songs fresh is that we're always kind of developing new techniques of writing and we're always uh, kind of pushing each other. We would sit in the garage and we would come up with riffs and we would record them on our crappy little iPhones and just kind of come back to them and eventually had enough money to get a recording rig, so we would just record all these ideas. But we'd just sit around, you know, like campfires, we'd sit around in the garage after school, and we would just allow it to flow out so organically. And it was so much fun because it was just like this explosion of creativity among our four, you know, selves. We'd play for six hours some nights, and, uh, you know, all of our fingers would be shredded, but, you know, we'd be super happy about playing all night, but you can't really do that on a record unless maybe you're the Grateful Dead. I think I got my very first uh, drum kit on Sweetwater. I'm my very first. That was handed down from my cousin. But but yeah, I like going out and actually like finding my kits. And I have a fantastic drum tech who, you know, makes sure everything sounds fantastic. Hi, my name is David. I'm the drum tech with Greta Van Fleet, looking after uh, Daniel Wagner. Start over here. Uh, the auxiliary rototons, gotta love those. And then we got the timbales here. These are actually a new new addition. These are from SJC out of uh, Massachusetts. 13 and 14 inch timbales. Got the black dots matching on them all. And then we got here the auxiliary crash. This one's kind of cool. Few cracks in it, but we ended up just notching it out and still works and it sounds cool. These with the uh, Pisces guy, very big on the Pisces symbols. He plays, I think all of these are 602s, uh, the Formula 602s. 
These are just the uh, 15 inch medium hats, love those. These are actually one of my favorite symbols he's got. And then we got a uh, 18 inch crash here. This is the, I wanna say it's a thin, yeah, thin. And then he uses the 22 inch ride. Or is this actually a 22 inch crash? That's something pretty unique. So they all kind of work together, but this has a, a pretty controlled bell versus like a, another 22 inch. Got some nugs, not drugs here, apparently. You know, that's important. Gotta have that going. Something cool that we did on this kick drum, being that it was gonna be clear this round, he wanted to make sure they're doing a lot of camera angles through here and just making sure that they wanted to keep it neat and clean, but still be able to, to keep everything muffled. So we got the Kick Pro here in the bottom, but we also uh, have a little felt strip behind here that Danny and I, during rehearsals, might be able to see it from that angle, but we just got a piece of felt, trimmed it down to get on the sword and does exactly what we needed to do. This is one of my favorite things. Actually, you would be surprised how many people go crazy over this verse. Anything else is the wind chimes. I mean, come on, the standard LP guys here. Can't really go wrong with them. He's Vic for a stick guy. These are actually one of the newer additions, thanks to our, our buddy Eric Gross over at uh, Zildjian and Vic Firth. Sent these out. This is just a 5A dual tone, and it's actually just a regular drumstick on one side. And then he can switch it around and do all the light, you know, cymbal stuff, and we have his snare drum. I think he got it on Craigslist, and he actually was something that was kind of awesome. As a drum tech, it's like, you think about it and you hear it, and you're like, oh, it's terrible, like, to, to have the confidence to do it, but he installed this, this muffle, I think, off of like a, I think it was like a, an old pearl muffle, and he actually installed that himself. Drilled in the drum when he was like, I think a teenager, and installed that. Props to him for that, that's cool. It's unique, I don't know if I would even have the guts to do that now, but. That's, the, that's one magic, that's one of my favorite pieces on the kit. He has been adamant about the Speed King. It's original, the original Speed King guy. Something unique that happened that we did with this is we had a pin break. Um, I can show you guys on a, on a backup pedal, but we had the pin break during a show, but he didn't want to switch his pedals up. He didn't really want to have to do something different. So we came up with just a stronger pin and with the help of our guitar tech, Johnny, actually, we came up with a unique pin system that's all bulletproof, like you can't, you're not messing with it, so. Hi, I'm Johnny Meyer. Um, I'm Jake Kiska's guitar tech with Greta Van Fleet. I've worked with Jake for going on almost two years. I think what got me into working on guitars is when I got my first guitar, I traded a kid down the road a skateboard for this guitar that he said he had. So I went over to his house gave him the skateboard and then he started handing me a guitar neck, a body, a bag of pickups and knobs and wires. And I was like, what's this? He was like, this is the guitar. So I had to learn how to put that guitar together when I was 13. And I think that kind of started me into not being afraid to work on guitars. You know, and by the time I got into high school, I'm tearing guitars apart and repainting them and putting different pickups in them and whatnot. So. That's kind of really where it started. When I first came in here, you know, and I, I would hear Jake play and watch him. I, he's, he's a very unique guitar player. He's, his sense of timing and phrasing and just what he chooses to play is interesting. And uh, that jumped right out at me. I really dig what he's doing on the guitar. We like to use old early 60s Gibson SGs, Les Paul SGs. Um, we have some originals and then a bunch of custom shops in there and, and uh, uh, reissues and whatnot. We do a little bit of, you know, pickup changes and some, some tuner changes. Not too terribly much as far as, you know, modifying them. Your usual pick, pickup change. Um, I have done a little body work on them. Put Dun Dunlop strap locks on every single guitar. The old style Dunlop strap button I'll put on there. That's about it as far as what I do with the guitars. This is, this is my kind of anchor here, the B3. Uh, it's actually an A100. Yeah, this is a custom uh, built B3. And like I was saying, it was an early influence on me. And you know, like all the great all the great tracks where there's like a, like the so, like the sounds on it. There's jazz, rock. You, you can do so much stuff with it. With so many iconic like songs. 
you know, like there's so many things that, so you hear it all over the place and a lot of like non uh, music people wouldn't necessarily know what the instrument is, but it's so prolific. And when my digital stuff goes out, it's always here because it's been working since the, the 40s, you know. So this thing is going on almost 100 years now. I think anybody who doesn't know what a Leslie speaker is has to know. Um, it is literally a spinning speaker. Uh, it's fantastic. And it produces this sound. Here we're, we're on Leslie's slow. It's a horn up top and a, a subwoofer down below. But you got, and then you switch it to fast and you can start here spinning. It's the best. It's like, you know, so it's, it's really cool. My Mellotron, which makes really cool noises as well. I mean, you can go in on the history of that too, which is pretty cool. And then my bass rig is actually down below the stage and I've got my stage speakers right over there, which were custom built in Nashville for the Star Catcher Tour. And this is what I've been using of late and I really love it because, uh, you know, I started on my, my Fender P bass, which is my, my pride, <laughs> my joy. And uh, I really wanted uh, the tone to poke through. I really wanted to kind of, you know, spike right through the mix. And that's really what this instrument does. These pickups, you know, you kind of think uh, like, like Getty Lee or, or, or Chris Squire, it kind of has that sound. Or even like some of those uh, McCartney solo records and some of the later Beatles stuff. But uh, yeah, it cuts right through the mix and uh, it's doing the thing that I really like right now. So I'm gonna stick on with her for a little bit. Mark is a mysterious man. Nobody knows where he came from and nobody knows where he goes at night. Uh, but all we know is he lurks in the shadows and he sets all of this up every day and he knows how the computers work and he knows all of the brains of everything that is interconnected here, which is a lot. We have a pedal system going with octavers and, and phasers and, and the, you know, boosts. We've got, uh, we, have, we have Nord sounds going, controlling other instruments and other sounds. And we have the, the fabled old B3 and we got the giant bass rig and we got bass rig down below. So there's a lot going on. And somehow he wraps his brain around the whole thing. Mark Messina, the, the official Sam Kiska tech, very sweet man as well. Hi, I'm Mark. I looked after Sam Kiska of Greta Van Fleet, and I'm here to talk to you about the bass and keyboard rig today. Well, it's pretty simple. The signal goes from the bass to the wireless to this radio four-channel distributor, and then it goes to the preamp, winds its way through the pedals. The pedals are all controlled by uh, RJM Effects Gizmo with the pedal board out on the floor and then it goes into a Fender Super Basement and one 8x10 cabinet. We don't really use the RJM to its fullest extent. Right now it's just like a glorified pedal board, but I'm sure that will change with time. Uh, here's a Hofner bass we don't play, but normally he plays a couple Rickenbackers and a Fender P bass. Well, the keyboard rig, the center of it is a Norton Stage 3, which is the workhorse, and then we have a Mellotron, we have a MIDI controller that basically just plays whatever the Nord has on it, just so he can reach it easier. And a Hammond B3 with a Leslie. All the keyboards handshake here at the rack in this Mio. And then I do patch changes with, again, a RJM uh, pedal board. We did add a Minotaur this year, which I'm pretty stoked about. We used to just use the stock bass pedal tones in the Hammond and uh, I was kind of gently pushing him going, there's a whole world out there, Sam. Synths are fun. I think he was a little cautious because they're you start tweaking knobs and you never get back to where you were. But this is great. This is a great first synth. It's like Fisher Price, my first synthesizer. Right there, it's perfect. What's up guys, I'm Chris, monitor mixer for Greta Van Fleet here in Indianapolis at the arena. Loaded in, no sound check today, and uh, this is the rig. Pretty simple, straight ahead, nothing really too crazy. It's just an SD10, um, 10 channels of PSM 1000, um, four channels of Axiom Digital here, and then we've got some split between backline racks that are 
also networked. Couple outboard pieces, Neve Shelford 5045, uh, Bercassidy M7 for lead vocal reverb, running wireless workbench, Pro Tools for multi-track record and playback. And uh, that's pretty much it, man. I mean, it's straight ahead. Claire CM14s are the wedges out here. Not really a whole lot going on, to be honest. It's straight up rock band. So everybody is wearing in-ears except for Jake, the guitar player on stage left. And so I have wedges kind of spread out um, to the positions where he hangs out most. Got a stereo left-right pair for his main position. And then I've got one down center strapped to a sub. Got one uh, backfill up here on this riser and I've got one at the end of the thrust. I have a show file that I've been working off of since rehearsals. Um, and each day it'll tighten up a little bit depending on what's going on in the room or if there's stuff that I need to work on from the previous night, um, I can jump into playback and tighten that up. But I'm just not a super program heavy show, but I have, sna I have one snapshot basically per song. Um, so I can jump into any of those and tighten up as needed. Hi, I'm uh, Tanner with Greta Van Fleet. I am a audio tech, stage tech, along with, you guys met Chris earlier, along with helping Chris set up his world throughout the day. A majority of my show is me running around, chasing these guys down and just making sure that they don't really need for anything. Uh, a big change this year for us is Josh just recently switched from a wired mic to wireless. So now he can go anywhere and everywhere. So that's a big part of what I'm doing is just following him around and making sure that he doesn't leave his microphone places like dressing rooms that has happened in the past. Came off for the encore, did his quick change, came back out, asked me where the microphone was. My initial reaction is, well, you took it with you, but I stopped saying that and just ran for the mic at that point because I realized that he didn't have it and it was in the dressing room. So we popped him over to the spare and I retrieved the mic and that's a little bit of what I do, running around and just chasing him down, trying to keep up with him. You'll see him, he'll be sprinting all over tonight. Uh, he plays a game every night with the spots to see if they can keep up with him. So he's, that's very much him. He just disappears and he's gone in a flash and then he'll pop back up over there and sometimes he has his microphone, sometimes he needs shoes, sometimes, you know, they need a drink refill. That's kind of where I come in and pop out. God forbid anything go wrong, repair an XLR here and there, but that uh, luckily doesn't happen too much. We started as a live band and we always played live, we played shows, uh, countless sh amounts of shows throughout high school, before, years before we ever even stepped foot in a recording studio. So when we got into the recording studio for the first time, we were, I think Sam and I were 13 or 14 years old, we had no idea what we were doing. Early on in our career, we would get into the studio and it was always very lackluster. So eventually, down the line, we ran into some people for the first time when we got to a certain level where we could actually elevate what we were doing live. We almost stepped into the studio with this very open-minded uh, idea of, you know, we had, we had amazing producers and engineers from Michigan, uh, Al Sutton and Marlon Young at the time, who basically taught us everything we knew up until that point because we had no idea what was going on in the studio and it's a very, very different setting uh, playing music live versus in the studio and it, well, live it's it's purely, you know, theatrical and, and emotion and, and it's, it's a lot of uh, intuition because we jam a lot, so it's a lot of impromptu. But in the studio, you kind of take all these ideas and you have to hone it into one final product. So we had to learn how to uh, almost dial it back a little bit because uh, it's not very uh, effective to have multiple nine plus minute songs on an album because that's, we're just trying to fill five hour time windows at bars growing up. But, so we almost did the inverse of that. We, we, we established ourselves as a live band and we have always identified as a live band. The stage is our home. And then going into the studio was a bit of a battle because we had to figure out how to maneuver that uh, the sonic quality that you get. Eventually we kind of figured out like, oh, you kind of have to capture the raw energy of the band in the studio. You can't, you can't do something where it's very contrived. You have to be 
spur of the moment. You have to capture what's going on between the band members, just like it would be live. So, but it's not as easy as it may, may seem. But I really love the way that uh, Dave Cobb captured the, the sound of, of Greta Van Fleet. I thought, I thought that was really great. And I think it might be our best sounding album yet. And it was, it was very natural. And we, there were so many different devices that we used that he just kind of pulled out. And, we, and it was very energetic. And we, we really threw it together fast, but very intentionally. It, actually, it, it translates really well live because of the simplicity of the music. It's all very attitude based. I guess I don't want to say it's very simple because I, a lot of the guitar parts and, and, and drum parts and whatnot, they're very, very difficult to play, but it's very energy and attitude driven. So I, it kind of very naturally translates into these, these big rooms. As a drummer, the way I get tones live is, is very different than how I hone in on a tone in the studio because in the studio everything is so mic'd up so close and it's so personal and it sounds so intimate but live you're just filling in a room you know it's 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 more so the visual aspects instead of the sonical aspects so um, I really had to teach myself how to use less of one hand versus the other hand in the studio because you know maybe I'm a I used to be a very heavy snare hitter compared to the kick drum so I would try to change the way I played to make it so when we were recording that it was all sort of balanced out and you didn't have to throw in a bunch of studio magic and make it you know very manipulated um, because we just wanted to make it sound like we were playing it live because we were but it's the struggle with the studio sometimes the technology's gotten so good that even when you are playing it live i don't believe it sometimes yeah.